happy uh, holiday to you guys. This is the last, I guess, kind of um, official holiday of the summer, so it's time to kind of get settled in and, and get ready for the fall. Football is in the air. <laughs> I knew that'll wake some people up. Today we're going to continue our series from the book of Ephesians, The Journey of a Jesus Follower. And we're going to be reading today uh, um, chapter four. We have so far covered the first three chapters of this book. So today we're gonna start in chapter four. We're gonna read verses one through 12. And I'll be reading from the NLT. Uh, you can follow along with me or you can follow behind me. It will be on the wall. Ephesians chapter four, verse one. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists and the pastors and the teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for this day. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for visiting us, for moving in our midst, for drawing us closer to God. Lord, we want to glorify you. We want the name of Jesus to be exalted. We want the people of God to be blessed and strengthened and their faith to increase. We want to see, Lord God, your hand that is upon each one of us manifest and revealed in a powerful way. So God, even now, we yield our members to you. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. Father, we yield to your word. We surrender the best that we know how. Now, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. Anoint the word of God today. I pray that God, that your people will hear from heaven. Let your word be released in this house. Let life be released, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Onesimo. Good to have you with us this weekend. Can we give the Lord a hand for Onesimo? Well, as we continue the series, The Journey of a Jesus Follower, today I'm going to share with you a message entitled, Call of the Saints. This title was chosen to emphasize the absolute necessity of every born again child of God knowing and accepting God's call that rests upon us individually as members of the body of Christ. I want to say that again. It is important. 
It is of necessity that each one of us know, understand, and accept. Everyone say accept. Very important that you accept God's call that rests upon you as a member of the body of Christ. For too long, the church has relied on a select few to do the work given to her by Jesus when in fact we're all called by God to carry out the Great Commission. Every single one of us. It doesn't matter if you have a title, want a title, or need a title. Title doesn't matter. Do you hear me? It is time that, 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 that we stop getting hung up on titles and on credentials. There's so many people in the body of Christ who feel like they need a title or they need a license to do what God's called them to do. And I'm here to tell you, you need neither. Amen. What you need to do is respond to God's call on your life. Amen. The Great Commission is not an assignment given to a select few, but it is a calling of God that rests upon every believer. And together, as each does hear the her part, we advance God's kingdom by establishing what his kingdom stands for, starting with our own personal life, and then letting that extend to those areas that we have influence over. Amen. Let me say this a different way. Listen. <laughs> She said I couldn't have made it in the planner. But I'm going to try to. I'm going to say it a different way. If you are not focused on letting the kingdom of God first and foremost be established in your personal life, forget about the area of influence that you have. It starts with us. It flows from us out. Together. Together we do this. And as we understand that we're all called, we begin to do the work that the body of Christ as a whole must do. You, you personally, say he's talking to me. Talking to say it again, he's talking to me. Talking to me. You personally must respond to the call of the saints. In 1903, a short adventure novel written by Jack London, was published. And the title of this novel was The Call of the Wild. And the major character in this novel was a dog named Buck. Now in the story, Buck was stolen from his home in Santa Clara Valley, California, and he was sold into service as a sled dog in Alaska. Can you imagine what that was like for Buck? Not only was he stolen from his owner, but he was also moved from sunny California to frigid Alaska. But something happened to Buck while in captivity. While in captivity, he became progressively wild due to the harsh environment he found himself in an environment that forced him to fight for his mere survival. 
By the end of the story, Buck had shared the veneer of civilization, of civilization that he'd known in his previous life and had, re, had learned to rely on his primordial instincts. Now I want you to find, put that word up for me, primordial. Primordial is that which is existing at or from the beginning of time. It is primeval, basic, fundamental. That which was in him by nature. That which was instinctive, primitive, basic, intuitive, and primeval. Buck tapped into his most basic fundamental instincts and he emerged as a leader in the wild. He learned that he had in him all along what was needed to become a leader even in a place that was foreign to him. A place inhabited by others more suited for the, for the, in the natural, more suited for the environment to become the leader than Buck himself was. But when he tapped into what was already inside of him, he responded to the call of the wild. And he became a leader of others. Others more suited for his environment. Others who had lived their entire lives under conditions that Buck had to adapt to. We're much like Buck. And that we found ourselves in a hostile spiritual territory as children of God. We've been taken out of the place of comfort as the world defines and given a mandate by God to rise up and become a leader among men. That's not just for me. That's for you also. I'm not the only one called. Pastor Andrew's not the only one called. You are called by God. And when you tap into what God has put in you, that which was in you from the beginning, see, first your spirit. When you learn to tap in your basic fundamental instincts, you will find yourself doing things you had no idea you could do. You will find yourself saying things you didn't even know was in you. You will find yourself responding to you like they never responded before. We become leaders for God when we respond to the call of the saints. Do you hear me? When you respond to the call of God that rests upon your life, you become a leader among men. Those of us who perhaps grew up with no outward appearances of leadership, and listen, I'm one of them. I grew up in a family of 10. Six boys, four girls. I was a baby boy. I had two younger sisters, I have two younger sisters. There's nothing about my upbringing that said you're gonna be a leader. Spent my whole life following, dodging. When you're the youngest, you know, you, you kinda get, you get the brunt of. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fighting for survival. <laughs> Those of us who grew up with perhaps no outward appearance of leadership must learn how to let God bring out of us the leader that is trapped within. Yes. We've been called by God let me make this personal. You've been called by God. You've been empowered by God. And you have been gifted by God to be a leader among men. 
And as children of God, we should not adapt the ways of, nor become followers of leaders of this world when it comes to spiritual matters. We should be leading them. We're God's children. We have the spirit of God living inside of us. When it comes to spiritual matter, when it comes to defining who you are, when it comes to living out your purpose and your dreams, why do you let some ungodly person determine what that is going to be? We must learn to rely on the primordial side of our being, that which is instinctive, that which is primitive, that which is basic, that which is intuitive, that which is innate, that which defined man from the beginning of time, for we were created spiritual beings. Let's return to living out of that place. Let's, let's return to the roots of faith, hope, and love that was put in us by God. In our scripture for today, we see here in the beginning of this text something we saw at the beginning of chapter 3. And that is Paul identifying himself as a prisoner of Jesus. Much like Buck, Paul found himself in captivity. But also like Buck, he rose above his conditions. He became a leader among men. Remember when Paul and Silas was put in jail in Philippi for preaching Jesus. After being severely beaten and thrown into the inner dungeon of the jail with their feet in stocks, something strange happened. Acts 16, verse 25 tells us that at around midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners heard it. They was listening. Why were they able to do this? They were able to pray and sing hymns to God because they knew they were not prisoners of the Philippian jailer. They were prisoners of Jesus. And verse 26 tells us that suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner, not just Paul and Silas, you're talking about having influence over over those that you're connected to. You're talking about having influence over your environment. It says the chains of every prisoner fell off. Why? Because Paul and Silas refused to see themselves as kept, being captive of man. They knew their heart had been captive by Jesus. And even in that place of captivity, after being not just beaten, but severely beaten. Sometimes we stomp our toe. And we let that stop us from praising Jesus. We have someone say something that we don't like. All of a sudden, we find ourselves in prison because we don't we don't understand that we're not captive by the things of this world. We must be captive. We're captive of Jesus and we must live out of that place of knowing into whom we belong and to whom we are prisoners of. When you accept your call. When you stand your ground for God. When you let God's kingdom first be established in you and flow from in you out of you, not only will God set you free, but he will work through you to also free others. One thing you must do. 
if you're going to respond to the call of the saints, is realize this call is not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about others. We want to make things too personal. When someone says something or do something that we don't like, we let that affect us and we start living out of the place of the flesh instead of living out of the place that is primordial, primordial within us. Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, is an appeal. Paul said, I beg you. It's an appeal by Paul for every believer to fully understand and accept not only the call of God that rests upon him and her, or him or her, but also the process. Please hear me. Everyone say process. process. The process needed to fulfill that call. There is a process that you must understand. This process is one of unity and spiritual maturity. It is a process that includes accepting the call of God, being equipped by God to carry out that call, and then participating with the Holy Spirit to fulfill that call. This process is one of unity and spiritual maturity. It is a process that includes, number one, accepting the call of God that's on your life. Number two, being equipped to carry out that call. Amen. And number three, then participating in ministry with the Holy Spirit yeah. and with other saints to fulfill yeah. that call. Paul writes in verse one, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Who is Paul writing to? Yes. He's writing to the church at large. He's writing to the saints of God. And he's writing to you. Paul said, I'm a prison for serving the Lord, letting it be known that his real captain was Jesus. He said, I beg you. That word beg means beseech or call for. It means to entreat or to pray. He said, I beg you. Remember I said, if you're influenced, the, God's, the establishment of God's kingdom was first start where with you. Paul said, I beg you that you lead a life that is worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. He did not say you can be. He did not say maybe God's going to call you. He did not say you can be called if you will accept your calling. He said you have been called by God. And because you have been called by God, live a life that's worthy of that calling. Amen. Listen, church, please hear me. I said it with as much love as I can. You can't live just any kind of old way and walk out God's calling on your life. You cannot do it. You cannot do it. Paul said live a life that's worthy of their calling. That word worthy means of sufficient weight. Of sufficient weight. It means to live a life that is sufficiently weighted with the things of God. Worthy speaks of a quality that issues from acknowledging what Christ has put in you. And this is not a worth that is based on what you may or may not feel. <laughs> You're not worthy because of what you do. 
You're not worthy because of how you feel. You're worthy because you are the called of God and you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That alone makes you worthy. And there's a lifestyle that is befitting of that call. You cannot live however you want to and be effective in your calling. And in verses two and three, Paul spells out what that lifestyle should look like. He said, always be humble and gentle. When are we to be humble and gentle? Ouch. Go on and say it. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Always be humble and gentle. He said, be patient with each other. Listen to me. Make an allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Can I make that plain, Sister Anita? Can I, make, <laughs> can I say that another way? Listen, we're to strive for excellence in our own lives, but we're not to expect it in others. That's what he's saying. He's to make allowances for other people's faults. Listen, instead of making excuses for your own. We're good about making excuses for our faults, but not giving place or making allowances for the faults of others. Paul said, because of love, make allowances for the faults of others. We're to strive for excellence in our own lives, but we're not to expect it in others. Instead, make allowance for their fault. Love always, listen to me, you got to get this. If you get this, this is going to help you. It's going to help you in your marriage. It's going to help you with your children. It's going to help you with your parents. It's going to help you in this church. It's going to help you on your job. It's going to help you in every relationship you have if you just get this. Listen, love always allows for others to fail. It allows for that. Love, godly love, when you have godly love, you don't expect perfection from other people. And one of the problems in the church is sometimes people expect men and women like me to be perfect. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not. I strive to be excellent, but I'm going to miss it. I've missed it with a lot of you. Forgive me. I promise you it's not intentional. I promise you. Godly love expects failure. Godly love accepts failure. And godly love forgives the failures of others. Paul said in verse three, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. In verses two and three, Paul reminds us that there's a lifestyle that is befitting of the call of God. And that lifestyle begins with us being united in the spirit. Can I tell you what I believe about unity? No one wants to know what I believe. Can I tell you what I believe about unity? I believe when we live under the control of the Holy Spirit, we walk in peace and unity. So if there's something, if you're not at peace with someone, if you're not at a place of unity with someone, especially someone in the body, that area of your life is not under the control of the Holy Spirit. It's under the control of your flesh. Just this past week, I was in North Carolina at a leaders meeting. 
flew there Thursday, we flew out Thursday, had meetings on Thursday, Josh and I did. Thursday afternoon, all day Friday, yesterday morning, flew back home yesterday. While I was there, the Lord showed me something that I needed to do Amen. concerning a brother. I did it. Now, let me tell you, I have, I feel 100% in my heart that there was no fault of my own. But if there is a place of disunity, I've got to respond to the call of the saints. And I've got to do everything within my power to bring that unity about. Anyone who causes division or strife in the church is not being influenced by God. But he or she is under the influence of evil. Please don't make no excuses for that and don't make any allowances for that. I said it because verses four and six is not written as something that Paul is hoping for. But in these verses, Paul makes a, makes declarative statements about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the church, about our faith, about our practices and about our unity. He said, for there is one body. That's the church. And one spirit. Just as you have been what? Called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all who is over all, in all and living through all. In these verses, Paul presents perhaps one of the most significant statements on spiritual unity found anywhere in the Bible. He contends that in the church of Jesus Christ, there is only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. Yes. So if your response to the call of God is not founded and grounded in unity of the Holy Spirit, something is wrong. Attitudes and behaviors of peace and unity will always be present wherever the spirit of the Lord is in control. Whatever area of your life that you allow the Holy Spirit to control, you will have an attitude, a behavior that speaks of peace and unity. Who is controlling you? What is controlling you? Again, you cannot live any way you want to and be effective in your calling. But we are to exhibit godly character and moral courage. Boldness to call evil, evil, and good, good. You're to exhibit personal integrity. Expect more from yourself than you expect from others. Amen. That's what integrity does. Don't expect certain things out of other people that you're not willing to do yourself. That is not integrity, that is hypocrisy. And we know how the Lord feels about hypocrisy. God expects us to exhibit mature behavior. That means we're to act like adults and not children. Mature behavior. There are some in the body of Christ who not only act like children, but they act like spoiled brats. Oops. Oops. Did I say that? They act like spoiled brats. Instead of behaving like servants, I'm going to meddle for a minute now. Instead of behaving like servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, too many, especially those who are called or who know they are called, they act entitled. They act entitled. That is not the behavior befitting of the saints of God. Amen. As saints of God who are called by God, people should see in us a gratefulness towards the Lord. Amen. They should see in us humility, gentleness, patience, peace, a spirit of unity. Their encounters with us should leave them with the impression that we will love them and bear long with them. 
Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 7, that God has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. What is that special gift? It is the grace of God that has been given to each one of us through faith. A grace to not only do the work of the ministry, but also a grace to live the life Paul described in the previous verses. God's calling on your life should impact both who you are in Christ as well as what you do for Christ. Both are gifts from God. And in verses 8 through 11, Paul writes, that is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave, and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher to all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. That is the purpose of Christ. That is what he wants to do in and through the church. That is why you've been called by God, that God may work in us and through us to fill the entire universe with, the, with Christ himself. Amen. These are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the gifts Paul talks about here are different than the gift he mentioned in verse 7. In verse 7, he was talking about God's grace or enablement that is given to each one he is called. A gift of grace that is given according to our faith in Jesus. But the gifts he mentioned in verses, in verses 8 and in verse 11 are people. Men and women given to the church as gifts, given personally by Jesus himself to his bride. Because he wants his bride to be taken care of. Christ, who descended from heaven, also ascended to the cross. From the cross, he descended into the belly of hell, to the belly of hell, and from there, he ascended back to earth and eventually back to heaven. And he descended, ascended, descended, and ascended again so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. The goal of Christ today is the same as it was when he graced this fear with his natural presence, and that is to fill the, the earth, the world, with his presence. That happens through us when we respond to the call of God to properly equip the church to fulfill her call. Jesus gave the church gifts. Gifts that are given to do two things. One, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and two, to edify or build up the body of Christ. That Greek word for equipping implies a recovered wholeness as when a broken limb is set and mends. It also speaks of a discovered function as when a physical member is properly operating. That means when you understand, accept, and begin to operate in your calling as a member of the body of Christ. Fivefold ministers are to help the church recover to a place of wholeness. They are to bring healing to the body. They are to help each member find his or her place. The work of ministry is the enterprise of each member in the church, not the exclusive charge of select leaders. And the task of the gifted leader is to cultivate the individual and corporate ministries of those that he or she leads. The gifted leaders were given by Jesus in order that everything in the church might be well arranged or put into its proper place. That the church might be complete so that every child of God may have every possible advantage for becoming complete in love, knowledge, and in living a life of order. One that is of peace, unity, and maturity. We are to edify, build up the church the body of Christ, 
that all of us would live in the knowledge of truth, power, love, and authority given to the church by grace through our faith in Jesus. You have been called by God. You have been gifted by God. And you have been given by God leaders to equip you that you may live out the call of the saints. Will you respond to God's call on your life? Some of you need to reach or search deep within and answer this one simple question. Am I living out God's call? Or am I just living? Am I just going through life? Am I just doing the best I can to just get to the end? I don't want to just get to the end, Brother Mario. I want to be like Paul. I want to empty myself of everything within me that's good. I don't want to die with what God's put inside of me without having poured my life out. That someone else may come to know the love of God like I know. Will you respond to the call of the saints? Will you respond to the call of God that's on your life? If you do, listen, you don't have to figure it out. God will show you. God will lead you, my dear, and do his perfect will for your life. You see, we we often get hung up because we can't figure it out. What I've learned is I don't have to figure it out. All I got to do is love Jesus and respond to the call of God that's on my life. Live every day like it's the most important day of my life. And let God, the grace of God that is upon my life, be poured out to others. We got to be like Buck. We got to respond tap into that which is primordial inside of us and let that flow out.